Great. Uh, yeah, so I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Justin Gottschillet. I, I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly enough. Yeah, so Perfect. Justin Justin is a, is a principal AI scientist at, uh, at the Intel Labs. He's also the found, founder and director of the machine programming research uh, group. Uh, I guess uh, Justin received his PG from Colorado Boulder. And also he's the PI of this upcoming, very exciting Intel Machine Programming Research Center, uh, where they are going to focus on the automation of uh, software development. And also there is a recent, uh, I think, uh, news highlighting one work that they have done, which is open source called Control Flag, which uh, we noticed a couple of days ago. That's really nice. So look forward to your talk, Justin. So uh, thank you for the very gracious introduction. Oh, let me just pull the mic over here. Hopefully that comes in better. And thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak at this venue. I, of course, like probably everyone else, is a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of ETH Zurich. Uh, clearly, uh, you've had so much historical institutional success that you're, you're sort of impossible not to pay attention to. <laughs> And when Martin invite, invited me a few months ago to speak here, I said, like, probably within minutes, oh, of course, you know, how could I possibly say no? So thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, as that the gentleman introducing me was just pointing out in the news, uh, we do have some new things to share, actually, that ha have just happened in the last couple of days. And I was working last night and actually just in the last hour to update these slides to include some of the things that you may have seen in the news on Control Flag and uh, have a GitHub link so we can all take a look at that uh, if we're interested. With that said, let me go ahead and dive right in. I don't think I need to give any more of an introduction for what I do at Intel Labs. I also have an adjunct professorship at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, principally that role is there to advise masters and PhD students, um, but I do teach um, occasionally as sort of an invited lecturer. And in fact, this semester, I'll be teaching lectures on machine programming at both Berkeley and MIT actually in just uh, the coming weeks. And so hopefully those will go on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in, in more details, you can potentially find some there. And then lastly, I'm the steering committee chair of the ACM Machine Programming Symposium. This is a venue we started back in 2000, I want to say 17, and it was joint with Intel Labs, Stanford, Berkeley, and Google. And it's all about machine programming. So if you find what I'm talking about today interesting to you, uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, potentially follow maps and then possibly uh, even submit some new papers. I know that Martin and others are doing a huge amount of work in machine programming. So I think this is this audience is very familiar with this space. Okay, so let's see here. Oh, so just legal information. Sadly, I have to put this up here uh, just to say that if your performance numbers vary from ours, uh, please don't sue Intel and we can discuss that offline. The overview, oh, oh, and before I dive into the talk, uh, I really prefer uh, interruptions. So if you want to interrupt me at any point, I'll probably stop at each one of these uh, different points here and ask if there are questions, but feel free to just jump in and cut me off. Uh, I much prefer a dialogue rather than uh, a, a 70 minute uh, oration. But for the high level overview of today's talk, we'll talk about NPR and Intel, and basically what it is, machine programming research. We'll talk about the three pillars of machine programming, which is the foundation of essentially everything we do. We'll dive into the bifurcated space of MP, and this part I think is really important. I think um, this audience probably gets this very well, but I have a lot of colleagues that seem to think machine programming is sort of just a rebranding of machine learning, and uh, it, it certainly is not. It's, it's distinctly different. And we'll, we'll talk about why it's different and how it's different when we get to that bifurcated space. And then we'll talk about a little of what's going on at Intel 
in machine programming, both from a research and engineering perspective. When I first started working on machine programming at Intel back in 2016, uh, it was just me. And today in 2021, there are thousands of us now working on this. Um, and of course, as, as you heard, we are launching a new machine programming research center. The solicitation just came out, I think last week or the week before it, that's joint with Intel and NSF. It's a $5 million center that will run for five years. And we will have at least one awardee, um, maybe more. Uh, so hopefully that's uh, something we can dive into at the end. So let's get started with machine programming at Intel. What is this thing? Well, machine programming, it, it, from my perspective, is really about the automation of the development of software. And the byproduct of that is it actually automates the development of hardware. And the reason for this is actually very simple. As most of you know, if you are designing hardware, a lot of the design of hardware is in writing software through things like Verilog or System Verilog, these um, hardware description languages or RTLs. And if we can automate software, well, we can automate that software. And then the byproduct is now we can start to automate the development of hardware. And, and Intel is interested actually in both of these things. Machine programming is a pioneering research initiative at Intel Labs. And I just found out last week that it is one of 10 uh, fundamental imperatives, I guess, as, as they're telling me, for Intel as a company. This is just to give you some understanding of just how important we think machine programming is. Essentially, machine programming is not likely to go away anytime soon. Uh, we likely would uh, maybe abandon different types of processors before we abandon machine programming. Uh, as the director and the founder of NPR, the way I formed the group is really around these two core tenants. And it's about time and quality. What we are striving for, and by no means do we have any plans of actually achieving this within the next like several decades, at least generalizably. But what our plan is, is to improve the time it takes to develop software by at least a thousand X and to generate software that is better than the best human programmers in the world. So we want essentially a, one way to kind of quantify it is what might take three years today, we wanna be able to do in a single day and also we want the resulting system that we can do in that one day to be better than the best programmers on the planet. So this is like very audacious. And in fact, all of the pioneering research efforts at Intel labs are meant to be audacious, that we are trying to achieve things that are out of our reach today. Otherwise we wouldn't be pioneering research. We would sort of be um, incremental research. That being said, we actually do have early data points that this is achievable. So we'll talk a little bit about this example, but what I'm showing you in, uh, on this slide is work from Maz Ahmad, uh, Alvin Chung, uh, Schwab, and uh, uh, I think JRK is part of this, Jonathan Riggin Kelly, and automating, uh, automatically translating image processing libraries to Halide. And what they did here is they built a transpilation system that automatically converted C and C++ code that was in production quality systems to Halide. And then the Halide system then did an optimization on it in a stochastic fashion. And they were able to get this geometric mean speed up of 3.3x. My personal view is this is astonishing. And part of the reason why I'm so astonished by this is 
we're not talking about some open source project that somebody just launched, like control flag, right? Like there's probably lots of things we can do to improve control flag. We're talking about version 21 of Adobe Photoshop, where this is professional grade software. This is software that they commercialize, they monetize on. And within six months, I think it took them about six months, they were able to transpile automatically, closed loop system, no humans were involved. They were able to transpile. And I think that if I'm recalling the data correctly, it took the system uh, 200 hours to transpile something like 300 functions that then resulted in this performance improvement. And this is deployed today. So if you download Adobe Photoshop 21, you will actually get this speed up using this transpilation system. Whoa. It's, it's pretty mind boggling. And what's fascinating about it too, is going back to the time and quality, is this is exactly what the charter of NPR is. This does this, they were before um, Moz and Alvin got involved. They, uh, Adobe was manually uh, converting the programs. I have a YouTube episode where I talked to Alvin about this. He explains it. And they were manually converting each of the function one at a time to Halide. Hey and as I understand, the way they've explained it is it's more than a thousand X improvement in time. And then it's better than the best human software, at least for Adobe Photoshop, because you can see that the, the performance improvement is quantifiably uh, 3.3 X better. So uh, as a scientist, uh, just to be very clear about the claim I'm making, uh, this does not generalize. So this approach is not something that we can use everywhere. In fact, one of the challenges that Alvin and I have, Alvin and I have worked together for a very long time. He's a professor at Berkeley. He was part of Kappa, which is the last research center that I ran. Uh, we're trying to figure out how we, can, how we can generalize verified lifting. And he's working on a system called MetaLift. And uh, we have some ideas. We're also working with Jonathan Reagan Kelly, if we can generalize Halide. But we don't know how to do that yet. So I wanna be super clear on my claims is that this is uh, specialized. This is domain specific, and this works for Adobe Photoshop because Adobe Photoshop is principally concerned with images. The Halide programming languages, programming language is principally concerned with doing optimization for image processing. And they wrote a custom Lambda calculus for verified lifting in the form of domain specific language that allowed them to lift the semantics from C and lower it into halide. So it does not generalize at all. But I think it's a great example of how, even though these two goals for NPR sound completely audacious, when I talk to people that I work with for the first time and I say, so here's what we're going to do. They, uh, can you say this again? Was there a question? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, no worries. So uh, uh, just to point out that this is something that we can do today for constraint spaces. And we'll talk a little bit more about this example and how this is possible, uh, especially in that bifurcated space that I talked about. So now we understand basically what the high level charter of machine programming is at Intel. Now I'd like to talk about the three pillars of machine programming. Uh, one of my colleagues, Tim Madsen, who's actually the last author in this paper, he often will uh, kindly joke about how it's impossible for me to give a talk and not somehow mention the three pillars of machine programming. And I think he's probably right. <laughs> it is really very difficult for me to do it. And I think part of it is we spent several years sitting around thinking about this before we published this paper. Uh, we probably spent three years talking, arguing, debating on what actually it, it means, this field of machine programming, and how it can be represented in a way that will help increase clarity for the researchers and also for the engineers, and essentially try to build the community around a common nomenclature that makes it very easy for us to understand what is happening conceptually within an instant 
on certain systems. So for example, uh, Ryan Marcus's uh, optimized data query system called BOW that just won the best paper award at Sigma, it's an adaptive system. And so we immediately, and, and Ryan's part of NPR, he's also jointly uh, with MIT under Tim Kraska. And when I talk to Ryan, he says, yeah, so BOW is adaptive and Neo is invented. And immediately my mind is able to quickly categorize, oh, okay, so I know what he means. These adaptive ones means there's probably some core building blocks that it relies on. The inventive one is maybe it's trying to actually do something novel. And then there are trade-offs of each of these things. So this is part of the reason why we wrote this paper is to try to establish a common nomenclature that we could work with to make it easier for people to understand the field of machine programming. And very quickly, the three pillars are intention, invention, and adaptation. Intention is... Per, it, I, all of these are very important, but in, in some sense, intention and invention in my mind are, are, are more important than adaptation. And the reason for that is adaptation is something we've been doing for a long time, which will make a sense probably in just a second. But intention is principally about finding new ways or improving the ways that humans and probably in the future machines communicate their ideas to machines. And the way we principally do this today is through writing code. That we write code and the machine understands the code and then it does stuff. Uh, one of the problems with this approach is, first of all, according to the data that I've seen, there's approximately 27 million people in the world that can code. Probably everyone on this call can, but we have a global population of 7.8 billion people. And one of the things I like to do is kind of draw the contrast to literacy. I think of, uh, there's this time you know, in the history of the planet where a large portion of the world, and there's still actually a large portion, as I understand it, that's illiterate. And when you're illiterate, <clears throat> it not only prevents you from learning through written form, like you wouldn't even be able to read this slide, you can't actually put down in words your ideas. So you can be the smartest person on the planet, but because you're illiterate, you can't express those ideas. And that can be very limiting. That's sort of what I think we have with our situation with creating software today. There are brilliant people out there that have incredible ideas, but they can't code. And so the entire world of software is closed off to them. And as the famous uh, Wall Street Journal article that came out like in 2004 or something said, you know, software is eating the world. Basically what that means is everyone is using software. Like we're on the Zoom call, that's all software. I'm presenting on PowerPoint, that's software uh, and so on and so forth. So if you can't create software, then the entire world is closed off to you. I, I think it's very similar to being illiterate. And I think that's really unfair. I think we need to fix this as the leaders and the drivers of this community in computer science that we should be opening our doors to the whole world and try to find ways to get all of these other people the power that we have. Because right now we are the 1% and I don't like being in the 1%. I hate it. I, this is not a place where I want to be. So intentionality is principally about finding ways to essentially allow the rest of the world ways to express themselves to the machine. And it's also concerned with taking existing things that have been expressed to machines and lifting out the semantic meaning behind them. And an example of that is the work that I was showing you earlier through verified lifting. And the, the work in Adobe Photoshop is that's a transpilation system. It's taking existing code, lifting semantics from that code, and then lowering it to another piece. My view is that the field of transpilation is going to um, just explode. And I think it's probably uh, one of the most important areas of growth in space of machine programming because we have a ton of legacy code, but a lot of that legacy code is in languages that people don't program in anymore. But we can, if we can build transpilation systems through uh, intentionality, then I think we can start to access those pieces of code. So that's basically intention. Uh, invention is once the intention is known, you generally, if you, know, you sort of walk through this like as a three-step process, it doesn't have to be like this, but this is just sort of like the canonical example, is that then you understand the intention, now we're going to invent the program, which can, 
can be broken down basically into the data structures and the algorithms that are necessary to fulfill that intent. And in most cases, the inventive systems that we've built are really not inventing much. Uh, there are some corner cases, I think, like our AutoPerf paper in NeurIPS 2019. I think potentially that is truly inventive because it's able to automatically synthesize performance regression tests that other systems uh, were uh, using that were not able to detect certain performance bugs, but our system was. So it's possible that it's actually doing some novel ideation. But uh, most of the time, it's actually just taking what exists and then putting it together in some potentially novel way to then fulfill the, the user's intention. That's invention. And then adaptation. And generally, when you do invention, you want it to be at this higher order level. You don't, you don't want to include any system level details, uh, no architectural details, no ecosystem details. And the reason for that is if you design it that way, it becomes very portable. Then you can what I call lower that higher order lambda calculus or whatever it is into potentially any programming language, uh, probably not, but many, and target various different backend compute devices. And so obviously it, it might make sense now why Intel is very interested in this is that we are, we, we clearly have moved away from being a monolithic hardware company that just sells CPUs to now we sell everything from CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, neuromorphic computing, quantum computing, um, and other ASICs. Uh, so, so yeah, so that basically captures what we do with uh, invention and then adaptation handles those lowering details is that once that higher order representation is put in place, the adaption pillar will kick in and then it will do these optimizations that are specific to the ecosystem. And then when we need to target another potential device or another ecosystem, we may go back to the original inventive, invented system and then lower back. Uh, but as my colleague Nesame Topkul constantly reminds me is I need to <laughs> always talk about data. And I think it is super important to acknowledge that data is the principal driver for every machine programming system that I've seen. There, there literally is not a single machine programming system that my team has built or I've read about, and I've probably read several hundred papers at this point in the field of machine programming. All of them use data in some capacity. Uh, some rely on only a small body of data and others tend to rely on very large pieces of data like control flag, which is churning on something like 1.1 billion lines of code. And we'll sort of get into why that is different and why that changes as you move uh, from stochastic to deterministic systems. So now that we understand what the pillars are, I wanna take just a quick moment to express an idea that I think is, is very important that is part of the reason why I think SQL, uh, SQL has been so successful and also why Halide has been so successful is this notion of uh, separation of concerns. That when we think about the three pillars, one of the things we've seen in our group is if you can build a system where intention is completely known and it doesn't include any details that are inventive or adaptive, it tends to allow the machine programming systems that will try to fulfill that intention to do it in a much more exhaustive and optimized way. And a concrete example of that might be, you're writing a program and then you decide, oh, I need to optimize this for x86. So you, you if def x86 and you write a whole bunch of code and then it does this. And now Alvin Chung's verified lifter comes in and he, he's trying to lift out the semantics. Now he sees this if, you know, def x86 and suddenly his, his verified lifter says, well, okay, what, what's happening here? It, is this, a, does this have semantic meaning that I need to pay attention to or is this just an optimization? And then on top of that, it's specific to a very particular type of compute device, a uh, device that has an x86 instruction set architecture. So it gets stuck. Whereas if those details are elided away 
and you just keep things at the intentional level, what we tend to find, at least in the research that I've conducted and the researchers that I've worked with, is if you can separate out intentionality very clearly, then the machine programming systems oftentimes will get potentially much better results in what they can invent and adapt. For example, Ryan Marcus, he's built two different SQL query optimizers, Neo, which was state of the art just a couple of years ago, and that's largely an inventive system. And Bao is his latest one that was at Sigma this year. And that's largely an adaptive system. What Ryan will tell me is a big beauty of his ability to build these systems is SQL. It is a declarative language. It's not quite intentional. I do think some of these inventive adaptive pieces slip in. Same thing with Halide. It doesn't quite get the intentionality uh, done exactly right, but it's very close. And it's because those details are not allowed to be specified by the programmer that the underlying systems have so much freedom to build these very complex uh, systems that are going to be more correct like they, they potentially can be more correct, potentially faster, more secure, all of these things, because you only specify the semantics of the program that's part of intention. And uh, if we basically go back to the prior example of Adobe Photoshop with verified lifting and halide, both verified lifting and halide are doing this, is verified lifting is trying to lift out the intention and, and they built a domain specific language to do this. <clears throat> and this is why they have to do the VL step first, the verified lifting step first before they go to Halide, because if they try to convert directly from C++ to Halide, they don't know for sure that they have the semantics captured correctly. So they need this uh, deterministic system to handle that component. And then when they lower to Halide, what's beautiful about Halide, if you're not familiar with it, I strongly recommend uh, it, you know, if you have the time to check it out. It's a programming language that Jonathan Reagan Kelly built uh, about a decade ago when he was doing his PhD at MIT. And he made a very simple observation is that when you are, when you are working in the space of image, image processing, you tend to have the need for two distinct people. Uh, the people that understand the image processing, these are people that are like professional photographers, these are web designers, graphic artists, and they really understand what they're trying to do graphically. And, but then they, they, don't under, they don't have a PhD in computer science, or, you know, like all of us. And so then when they try to do things on these images or these videos, it, it can be a very long process. You know, for example, when I do my YouTube videos now, uh, I, I hit convert and it, it just spends like an hour converting it to the right format. And that's all because the, the video processing, the image processing is a, a very computationally intense piece. So what Jonathan realized with Halide, he'll separate it out that the image uh, experts will be given a domain specific language that, that speaks their language. And then he will allow a backend that he calls the uh, scheduler, where essentially what we refer to at Intel as ninjas. These are people like with PhDs in computer engineering, and they deeply understand hardware, they deeply understand software, and so they can write very fast code. Uh, so the ninjas then can come in and write the scheduling piece. And so initially when JRK designed Halide, his intention was just separation of concerns, separation of intentionality from, in some sense, uh, adaptation and, and, and a little bit of invention. And, and Jonathan and I have, have worked closely together for several years. We think he didn't quite get it right. It's pretty close, but uh, some of the inventive pieces kind of slipped into Halide. So we're, we're, we're working on upgrading Halide so we can make a better um, separation there. But initially, it was meant to be two programmers. And then something amazing happened. Jonathan and his team realized, well, wait a second. Uh, with all these advances happening in machine learning, what if we just optimize? What if we build an automatic learning system that can learn the optimizations? And so in their SIGGRAPH 2019 paper, 
I think they talk deeply about this and they show for the first time, uh, at least according to uh, Professor Kayvon Badhalian out of Stanford in my last discussion with him, that this is the first time that they've ever seen halide get super human performance in an automated way. And by superhuman, they mean they're trying to write the most efficient schedules. So these are all, you know, some of the smartest people on the planet when it comes to halide. They're writing the most optimized schedules that they can they can write, and the computer's beating it, and it's doing it in a fraction of the time. So literally, it's like it's taking them hours to write it, and in one of the papers, it takes no more than four seconds for the machine to to, to synthesize the uh, optimizations. Uh, I think the latest paper takes a little bit longer, but. Uh, anyway, the, the, the takeaway here is that as we move forward in machine programming, I think it's very important for us to consider this idea of separation of concerns and trying to build programming languages. I, I, I would love to see a generalized uh, intentional programming language. I have to be honest, I, I think maybe that's not possible. Uh, all the ones that I think come close could be intentional. The two that pop to mind are SQL and Halide, and there's probably some others. Uh, you know, maybe Julia. They um, they allow for a lot of these really powerful optimizations under the hood, and I anticipate a, just a, a growth. Just a, yeah. But just a, just a quick clarification: by intentional programming, are you really referring to? Uh, what uh, Charles uh, Samoli introduced, intentional programming, or you mean something else? Is this the, uh, sorry, I might be forgetting his name. Is this the gentleman from Microsoft? Yes, he, he, yes. he yeah. So he, you know, basically he that, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so this is sort of this, so thank you for raising this. This is a really weird coincidence is we mm -hmm. wrote the three pillars paper and we came up with all this language and then someone, you know, like yourself said, what are, is your intentional programming the same as this person? And I was like, well, I don't even know what this is. And then I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's basically exactly the same concept. Nope. Is uh, It might be slightly different, but I think our goals are, are almost identical. Is that we wanna just specify intention and then when intention is specified, then it allows the machine to do a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm not current with his work, so it's possible he's made uh, more advances that I, I might not be aware of, but yeah, I mean the idea was from thirty years ago, right? From right, right, absolutely, yeah. So this is not necessarily like this new idea. In fact, most of these things, like adaptation, uh, uh, the reason why I say we adaptation is the least interesting to me is we've been doing adaptation for seventy years. Uh, all compilers are essentially adaptive systems. So, but now what we're trying to do is basically say, look, we've got all these core pieces. Let's be focused in the way that we move forward and understand the bigger picture here, that if we can get these intentional programming languages, then they allow the system more freedom on invention and adaptation. And we already have those in place and we can start to leverage some of those things. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, okay, yeah, so now we're ready to move bifurcated space. I guess I will, I, I'll pause to see, are there any other uh, questions that people might have? Okay, super. So the bifurcated space of machine programming, this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, probably maybe too vehement about, I guess maybe <laughs> sometimes they're very lively about this. Uh, and largely it's because I really wanna make sure that we are not being narrow in our thinking. Uh, Andrew Kaparthi in 2017 wrote a blog post called uh, Software 2.0, something like this. And he explained Software 2.0 is uh, forget about traditional programming, it, you're done. Neural networks are gonna replace all code. And at the time, I think that there's a place for neural programming for sure. And in fact, many of our systems do neural programming where the idea is that you essentially use some advanced neural network to replace some heuristic and it learns over time and it can be better. But that position is really narrow in my mind. Uh, I don't think neural networks 
are going to solve all of our problems. I think the world is much bigger than neural networks, and we should be inclusive to all types of systems that we can build for machine programming. And when I think about it, and if you know you have other thoughts, this is this is like obviously work in progress. We, I, don't, I don't think we really understand the field of machine programming, and I'll probably talk about that at the end. If we did, Intel would already be building the hardware for machine programming systems because we're trying really hard. We just don't fully understand it. Uh, but I tend to think about it in these two ways that there's a stochastic side and a deterministic side. Now, the stochastic side, one small sliver, this neural network part right here, just this one piece, that's software 2.0. But the rest of it, all this stuff, that's not software 2.0. And that goes to show how just small software 2.0 is, is in the big scheme of things. It, one, it doesn't even cover the entire stochastic side. And then two, it doesn't even touch on the deterministic side. That most people, I think, that are working in the space of machine programming um, may be seeing this in a way that it's ML for code, uh, like um, OpenAI and GitHub Copilot. Right, so take GPT-3, tweak it a little bit, build codex, and then you take natural language and out pops a function. Super awesome, really impressive work. Just my hat off to OpenAI, Microsoft and GitHub for that work. That's really fantastic. But that doesn't include any deterministic components as I understand it. And the problem with that is without that determinism, you always tend to require a human in the loop because stochastic systems by nature are stochastic which means they have some sort of randomness of uh, perturbation. And that usually means that some human is likely to have to be involved to then say, yes, I agree that this is right. But if you have a fully deterministic system, like the stuff that comes out of Armando Solar Lozama's group at MIT, or the stuff that Alvin Chung is working on verified lifting, you tend to not need a human in the loop that it can just do the, the full formal verification. Uh, Ishil Dillig is doing this also at UT Austin and several other people. This part I think is supremely important. And in fact, all the systems that my team build, almost all of them use both sides. And I'll show you two concrete examples of that and explain here's the deterministic component and here's the stochastic component. And the truth is, as we move forward in machine programming, it's my belief that the advances we made on the stochastic side have been tremendous over the last decade. I think that that's not the hard part anymore. I think the hard part is the deterministic side. I think that's the side that is going to be sort of the secret sauce for many of the advanced research systems. And I'm not saying that there isn't going to be like transformer version 17 coming out. I think all that stuff is going to happen. But uh, some of the more powerful things like the aroma system that came out of Facebook and Berkeley, it has no stochastic elements. It's completely deterministic. It just builds a new code representation that is intended to lift semantics from code syntax. And it intentionally drops syntax. It's actually a unidirectional transformation. You cannot go, as I understand it, from Koshik Sen you cannot go from code to the SPT, the Zimbabwe like parse tree, and then back to code because it drops things. And it does that because it is trying to just capture the semantic meaning. And it, as I understand, is actually used in production quality code at Facebook for um, uh, natural language to code querying. Again, fully deterministic. So I, I really want to just hopefully harp on this. Uh, it just, I have lots of friends at Google AI and I'll talk to them and say, explain this. And they'll say, just, Justin, this is just ML for code. Or, you know, we call this ML for code. I'm like, oh, geez, I just, we're not there yet, <laughs> right? We're still not quite getting it. Um, and so my hope is that we can uh, sort of help the community see that there's more to the world than just the stochastic side, or at least this, this is my view. So. Uh, and feel free to push back and tell me that I'm wrong and, and you know, why I'm wrong. I, I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas. Uh, one other thing I'd like to quickly add about stochasticism is, as I was mentioning with data, what, what our team tends to find and a lot of the people that we work with tend to find is that uh, the stochastic systems tend to improve as we give them more IID data. 
So this is uh, independent, identically distributed data. And I, for all of you ML experts, this is probably, you, you all know this, is the idea is you wanna essentially have data, but data that's meaningful. So it, it doesn't matter if you have, you know, 3 million lines of code all saying that basically the same thing. But if each of those 3 million lines are doing something distinctly different, well, that's really helpful for these systems, or it, it can be very helpful for these systems. Uh, so one of the things that you will tend to see in the field is that when people are building stochastic systems like control flag is, is both deterministic and stochastic, but it's principally driven by stochasticism. It requires, it does significantly better the more data you give it. So when we were churning on just like 100,000 lines of code, it basically was worthless. Once we broke 10 million lines of code, it started to have value. Once we broke 1 billion lines of code, then suddenly it was finding bugs that were like, it, it learned what pointers were, which just still kind of blows our mind. We, we, I remember the day that we found this out and we were like, how does it understand pointers? Uh, so really interesting stuff about the stochastic side is that data I think is the driver, is one of the key drivers, like I was talking about before. Uh, do you have a question? No, Justin, I just want to remind us, uh, I think uh, we are a bit short of time. Hmm. If, yeah. yeah, sure. I, yeah, I'm, I can certainly speed this up. I've got, uh, my clock says I've been presenting 40 minutes. How, how much time do I have left? I think uh, we allocated each speaker 45 minutes. Oh, I somehow misunderstood that. Okay, yeah, well, I'll, I'll pick up the pace then very quickly. Okay. So let's, let's move very fast and finish in the next five minutes. Um, so just as a refresher on what the two systems that we were talking about uh, with uh, Adobe Photoshop, Halide is a stochastic system, Verify Lifting is a deterministic system, and that kind of enables us to do what we're doing. Another concrete example of that is what Armando is doing with his understanding the world through code NSF expedition system. And that's a neurosymbolic system, but this is also bifurcated. It has the stochastic side and it has this deterministic side. Okay, so now we will fall into the last piece of the talk, which is discussion about some of the things that we're doing at Intel on machine programming. The key areas that we're sort of targeting today are debugging, profiling productivity, and then automated performance extraction. In fact, Intel has launched an internal venture called Intian that uh, is, is working entirely on the space of automated performance extraction. Uh, and like I was saying, I think we probably have uh, thousands of people working on this at uh, Intel at this point. Uh, one quick interesting data point going back to how important data is, is when we built MISM, we were able to beat the state of the art by about 2x with 400,000 programs. But when IBM and MIT wrote their project code end paper, they had results that MISM was able to beat these other systems by up upwards of 5x. And we still haven't done a deep analysis on why this is, but we have a sneaking suspicion that it has something to do with the fact that the number of data that they collected has more than doubled going back to the importance of data with stochastic systems. But as many of you probably know, as we're building these MP systems, a lot of them are without labels. So what can we do with uh, out labeled data? Well, before we focus on that, let's just quickly talk about, well, why would we target debugging to begin with? If you look at this University of Cambridge study that came out in 2017, it basically showed that 50% of the development cost is software debugging. And also most of the people that I know are not that fond of debugging. So we figured this is a really good uh, area to target. So one of the ways to do automated debugging is to try to find code anomalies. And a code anomaly is something that's essentially irregular and uh, irregular code can lead to de defects, technical debt, uh, hard to maintain code, so on and so forth. An example of an anomaly is shown here in this curl code. So we presented this to curl and you can see this line, if keep on is greater than true. And what that essentially, if you're familiar with C and C++, uh, false is zero and any non-zero value is true. 
So what does it mean for something to be greater than true? We were confused. So we reported this to Perl. They agreed with our findings. They then updated the code and now it's in the mainline. This uh, was found actually by Control Black. Now there are existing code anomaly detectors. Uh, these systems have been around for decades, but one of the core limitations that these systems have is they require continuous human effort to maintain an update. And as we all know, humans, sometimes we make mistakes. So how do we fix this? Well, we built this system called Control Flag. We published this at MAPS earlier this year. Uh, we invented it uh, at the end of last year, and we just open sourced it uh, last week. So I have a slide at the end to take a look at that. And the Control Flag, as uh, we, we've seen, it's been all over the news. And why is that? Well, my belief is that it's because it can do three things. Is it self-supervised, so it doesn't require any labels. Uh, it's self-evolving, so it doesn't require a full retraining of these systems, uh, like some of the bigger um, systems that I won't necessarily name by name. Uh, and then lastly, it doesn't require compilation, so it can just look at code statically uh, without being uh, requiring a level of compilation, which some of the linters and static analyzers require. So we did an analysis of control flag against a whole bunch of open source repos and it found, and these are very hardened repos like Git, and it found a number of anomalies. Um, but we also looked at proprietary software. So I can't tell you where this code comes from. And what I can tell you is it is deployed and it has three vulnerabilities that control flag found. The third one is probably the most dangerous. Just very quickly, what it is, is it's a jump. It, the second array is actually not a fixed array. It's actually a dynamically allocated pointer, and, but there's no check on the upper bound of index. And therefore it could jump to out of bounds memory. And as we all know, that could lead to some really dangerous things. So a really smart programmer can inject code in your iCache. I can get you to jump to that location and now I can root your machine. Needless to say, when C Control Flag identified this, uh, the, the team that was working around this, they quickly uh, agreed with our findings and they, they fixed their code. And just a high level overview of that repository, it found essentially 104 repos. We looked at the second repository, it found about 191 uh, re um, unique anomalies. And it's also being used to churn on something like 65 million lines of code. And one of our uh, partners is integrating control flag into their continuous integration uh, development environment. Uh, so with that, I'm going to just skip over the whole co code semantics section, since I, I think I somehow misunderstood the time, my apologies, um, and uh, just jump to essentially the end, which is uh, th these two things. So we, we basically gave a quick overview of the research charter, the three pillars, the bifurcated space, I uh, walked very quickly through control flag, we skipped over MISM, but I think that uh, I'll probably upload these slides somewhere. So if you're interested, you can see more about that. And uh, we are excited, very excited about machine programming for the future. And we're doing a whole bunch of things. So first of all, we're growing out NPR and we're growing out machine programming across the company. If you're interested in machine programming, please feel free to contact me directly. Uh, we, uh, in, in our group, we're looking for uh, excited uh, PhDs and beyond. We also, uh, as has been mentioned, have a bunch of industrial and academic collaborations. Um, th this one is really exciting to me. We have the new Intel NSF Machine Programming Research Center uh, mapped this year. I'm really delighted to announce that Charles Sutton will be our program chair, which he's from Google AI. He's very well known in the space. And we also have our machine programming website on LinkedIn, we're on Twitter, and we have a new YouTube channel for machine programming. And then last but not least, we have the link here for Control Flag. It was just open sourced last week, and it seems as though um, people are, are getting pretty excited about it, which makes us very excited. And with that, uh, I can conclude. So many apologies that I somehow misunder, <laughs> I guess I'm giving too many talks and not paying enough attention to the time. <laughs>
Okay, thanks, Justin. Probably, you know, we did not make that very clear. Yeah. So our apologies also. Totally my fault. Okay, I think let's probably take a, take some quick questions from the audience to see, yeah. Okay, anyone? Yeah, maybe uh, just just a quick question. So you did not mention about the false positive, right? I mean, one issue with such tools is usually we have a large number of false positives. And That's right. Uh, th and that is actually one of the biggest weaknesses that we're working on with um, Control Flag. And if I can recall off the top of my head, we had about 50% false positives for this analysis. So it essentially flagged 200 things and only 104 were real defects. Mm -hmm. And then on this one, I think it was also about 100 false positives. So that was roughly, I think, like you know, 30, 33% or whatever that is. Uh, so it is very challenging. One of the difficulties we're running into is you can control the knob essentially on how to control the anomalous points. But as you turn the knob down, it also stops finding true positives. Uh, so we, we have some ideas on how to improve this that we're working on, but this is one of the big issues that we have today. I think that's an excellent point. Okay, yeah. So, so just another maybe follow-up question is, so all the kind of bugs that you're finding here are more like a syntax-oriented, syntax right? So how do you maybe push this kind of technology to find more semantic bugs? Yeah, I, this, I love this question. And this is actually the next piece that we plan to build into Control Flag. I didn't get a chance to talk about uh, this, but I'll just show you this one slide. And it's my belief that code semantic similarity is probably one of the most important open problems in machine programming. When we built MISM, one of the core ideas of MISM, which is our code semantic similarity system, which um, you kind of see a little bit of its design here, has both deterministic and stochastic point. The idea essentially is we are now working to integrate pieces of MISM into control flag. So then it can do both syntactic and semantic defect detection. Uh, so we have ideas, I think, on how to do this. We haven't started this yet, but it's on our roadmap for 2022. That's an excellent question. And it's one of the drivers of where we're going. Thanks, yeah, Malti? Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about control flag. So uh, on the evaluation slide, you uh, had a bullet that said um, overly complex code patterns were found. Um, so as I understand, that's something the system learns. So you train it with, say, good programs, which do not use overly complicated expressions. And then it learns what simple or reasonably complex expressions are. Uh, and then it can detect overly complex ones in other systems. Um, so my, my question is, I mean, what, what, what counts as overly complex? And in particular, I don't know how, how you should name things, how you should partition your code into smaller units often depends on the community. Uh, functional programming people have a different view on this and Java people, probably a different one than C++ people and so on. So do you think that the system would have to be trained for individual companies or communities? Uh, because I guess with a, uh, with a machine learning system, it's, it's not so simple to configure it and say, well, and now use th this definition of overly complicated and now use that other definition. Can you say something about that? Yeah, uh, again, a fantastic question. Thank you for raising this. Um, I think you hit on a number of things that we've all run into. Uh, so let me see if I can address one of the first ones, which was um, training it on specialized environments. Uh, I think that that is definitely one way to move forward with control flag. And we are actually doing this. So for example, uh, most of the things that we found are in C and C++, but we actually have built in Verilog and system Verilog support. Obviously being at Intel, there's a lot of that. And so a lot of the training that we're doing internally and these are things that I don't know that they've been shared with the community, uh, are uh, learning on smaller repos, but are very customized for Intel. 
And these are things that we are, their production quality, we train on them and then hopefully find defects in later generation uh, Verilog, system Verilog code. Uh, the, what we tend to find at least right now is uh, we haven't had that much good success. And I think the problem is it's not enough data. I think it's very similar to like when we had 100,000 examples, it wasn't enough, but then we got to about 10 million and it started to do something interesting and then so on and so forth. So one of the big limitations is having enough data. So languages like JavaScript and Python are probably gonna be very easy, but languages that are more esoteric uh, like maybe Julia, it, it might be harder for control flag to have value for those languages. Uh, then as far as your overly complex uh, comment, yeah, I, I think this was a really weird, there was a, something, something amazing that happened one day is I was mentioning how it, it learned what pointers were. And it was very fascinating. We, we never expected, I mean, we, we just thought this just was going to be a research toy. Uh, and we just thought it was a cool idea. So we implemented it. And then it came back and said, hey, there's a bug here in this code. And we looked at it and we we're like, wow, it's right. It can see that we're using the pointers wrong. I don't think I have the example in, in this case, but it's because I, I suspect that it had seen so many good examples on how pointers should be used. And of course, like we haven't done a deep analysis on how it actually has learned this, but we know that it has figured something out and can detect in certain cases when pointers are being incorrectly used. And so these, this is an example of sort of like the complex things that it can find. Okay, very impressive, thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. So Justin, I think there is a question from Marcel in the chat. He said, uh, Intel, uh, maybe Marcel, do you want to ask this question yourself or? Sure. Um, so my question is, Intel being a chip manufacturer, are there any plans to provide more hardware assistance to program analysis, like debugging and program synthesis? Yeah, uh, can you repeat the, I think I got the question, but can you repeat it one more time? Yeah, sure. So Intel is a chip manufacturer. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, curious whether you're planning to have any hardware support and implement like hardware assistance into uh, Intel chips for, for performing these tasks more efficiently on a hardware level than on a software level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the truth is we talk about this ever. So uh, another fantastic question. Thank you for raising this. Um, one of the advantages obviously of pushing some of this tech down into the hardware is it will run much more efficiently. And for example, we just built control flag into uh, visual code and it works, but it's a bit sluggish because the models are enormous uh, in, in, in terms of what it has to churn through. So if you're on a, on a low powered uh, device, like a, a Chromebook or something, it, it may stall out your whole IDE. But we do have plans to identify the core components that we think are necessary for machine programming and lower them into our future generation of hardware. Uh, very much like people have sort of figured out that uh, deep learning can be done very effectively, at least in the training phase on GPUs. We, we believe other similar types of concepts will exist in a sort of generalized fashion across many machine programming systems. And once we have a collection of those things, we have early indications of what some of those things are, then we'll likely to build small little additions uh, probably, you know, we, it might start out just as a small FPGA that sits alongside the CPU that then sort of can reconfigure itself to specific MP problems that you're solving. And then we push the algorithm down into the FPGA if you're going to do this enough. So, so we do have plans to do that. We haven't quite figured out what those hardware elements are. Uh, but if any of you have feedback on this type of thing, I would, I would love to hear your ideas. Does that answer your question? Yep. Okay. Okay, let's take a final question from Demeter. So Yeah, so so my question is on the use of IID data and the collection of it. Uh, so like I, I feel that unlike in traditional machine learning, collecting IID data for programs is much harder because like uh, say if you take all of the data from a single GitHub repo, you're getting uh, data that is uh, 
very biased towards that particular data source. So my question is, what do you do to collect diverse IID data that is truly IID and not just like uh, learning patterns from a particular GitHub repo? Yeah. Uh, is it Dim Dimitra? Yes. So Dimitra, uh, you hit on probably one of the most important problems and weaknesses in control flag right now is we have a ton of data. We, the, the way we just discuss this today, and if you look at the paper, you'll see us discuss, we call, we call the concept semi-trust, is we're trying to find a way that we can use environmental data to guide the system on what repos it should look at based on things that are in the environment that tell us that it's good and it's potentially different. Uh, this is an open question. Right now we do something completely naive. All we do is, well, we do a couple things. I think we look at the number of contributors, we look at the number of stars, we look at the, the longevity of the project and a bunch of other things. Hopefully uh, everyone, okay, sorry, I just froze for a second. Um, but the truth is, this is, we're, this is, we're just ad hocing this, is we need to figure out a much more systematic approach to try to do the IID problem in these repos. And currently, uh, just to be completely honest, uh, we don't know how to do this. Uh, we're kind of winging it in some sense. And uh, what we found is that, at least on our first pass, as we were finding the, the meta environmental data that gives us guidance on which repos we should learn from, uh, it seems to be doing okay, but we think we can do much better once we understand a more systematic approach on how to uh, start to do this type of deeper analysis. If, if you have any ideas, or if anyone on this call has ideas on how to improve that, I would love to hear them. Control Flag is open source now. We're hacking on it every day. And so we, we'd be more than happy to fork off a branch, put in an idea, and then just see what happens. Thank you very much. Great. No, thank you, Dimitri. OK, let's make uh, Wang Chiu's question the final one, right? Just really the final one. OK. OK. <laughs> uh, hi. Thanks for the great talk. Just a follow up of the, of the last question. Uh, do you have any indication that uh, your tool control flag would perform better on some cases if it was given a different or more diverse kind of data from different data sources and so on? Yeah. Uh, so like I was saying before, what we saw is um, when we used smaller code body, it, it seems not perform very well. It would be really interesting if we could do some analysis where perhaps the code that we're looking at just wasn't diverse enough and that adding more code got us the diversity and maybe there are just certain ones. So one of the ideas of semi-trust is, and, and we're just sort of teasing this out, is the idea that certain repos will have a higher, a larger value and that will add a stronger weight of bias in the anomaly detection system because of the quality characteristics that we see in that code. And so we're starting to tease out how to do this. Like, does it have a, does it have a test harness? Does it have all these test cases? Is this used in production? Uh, these types of things. And then we're gonna plan on weighting the biases to use this as a, as a bigger driver. And so I think it's it may be possible. I would love for someone to potentially do this study. And, you know, maybe we'll do it, but if any of you are interested, I think this would be a great thing to look at is see if we can make control flag work on a small number of repos. So like I was saying, people are already using it and they're saying control flag just ran for eight hours straight and it didn't find any anomalies. I'm really sad. And we're like, oh, we're sorry. And then other people were like, okay, it took, it, it, it just crashed because I, I only have 16 gigs. So the models are so huge because it's looking at 1 billion lines of code. So we built smaller models that we released this weekend. And we know that they have reduced accuracy. We've looked at some of the things it can't find. It's entirely possible that it's just because the IID isn't right. 
and that we're not getting enough good diverse data. So if any of you have any thoughts, please feel free to email me. Uh, like I said, Control Flag is open. We love collaborating with people and we would love to work with all of you to make this better and just share it with everyone. Thank you, Mocho. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> sorry, thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, uh, for, for the answer. Uh, then uh, have you have you thought of have you thought of some systems that uh, generate this ID data or generate uh, some yeah some examples? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. <laughs> I'm sorry that this is going on so long, but I <laughs> can't help but answer these. <laughs> um, we, we have so we've actually built a few different um, program synthesizers. And we're working with people in the space of program synthesis specifically to do this type of thing. We haven't released this yet, but one of the systems we, we built a few years ago that is called DOTSA. It's open source. I'll send the link out somewhere. And we're using DOTSA now to generate code that we know is IID. Um, and so, but right now the programs that it's building are, they're limited in the both their size and the diversity of instructions, uh, simply because the space of program synthesis to ensure uniqueness, as you probably know, is, is this is a very computationally intense process. Uh, so, but we do have those systems already in place. Right now, they're not building enough what we would consider useful programs, but I think we're starting to make breakthroughs to potentially get there. And, and if you wanna read more about one of the systems, we, we published, um, a paper at ML this, this earlier this year called uh, uh, Learning Fitness Functions for Machine Programming. And it uh, automatically generates the uh, fitness function using um, a neural network. And then it expedites its ability to do program synthesis through genetic algorithms. Uh, but I would love to chat with you more if you have ideas on ways to make us build more, to synthesize more programs that are IID that have less computational overhead. That's one of the one of the big challenges that we're running into. Uh, excellent question. Thank you so much. This is, I'm learning more from the audience here than <laughs> you're learning from me. This is fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Let's uh, thank Justin again, and also all the speakers for this for today. And uh, I guess also want to thank uh, David and uh, also as the co-host uh, of this, the hosting of this meeting, and also all you folks who are participating in, this, in, in today's uh, workshop. So, and we look forward to tomorrow's exciting talks again. Thanks everyone. <laughs>